and attendees. If you could mute yourselves during the panel, that would be great. Of course, if you have questions as we move along, do not hesitate to put them in the chat box and we will try our best to answer them, uh, as, many, as many of them as we can. So also, uh, please live tweet if you find the advice helpful. Hashtag Hopkins tweet. So let's get going. Before uh, we start with the rest of the questions, can you all tell us briefly a little about yourself, your background, work at Hopkins? So I think Sarah, let's start with you. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a second year PhD student and I went to Georgetown for undergrad. Um, I'm a big basketball fan. Luckily the game just ended and they won. This was their first time uh, winning a game in our conference tournament in five years. So I turned off my video before because I was crying a little bit. Um, and so after Georgetown, I worked in science policy in DC for a couple of years. And I think that kind of helped with the Twitter voice just because I got to see like people kind of using it as colleagues and as equals. Um, and yeah, in my free time, I like watching basketball. I am on the bike team at Hopkins and I like being outside. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Nathan? Hey, uh, I'm Nathan Daniels. I'm a finishing PhD student in the Department of History. Um, I work on uh, medieval France as my area of specialty uh, and have interest in the digital humanities as well. Uh, I am also in my spare time an instructor in the expository writing program and also a program coordinator for the um, for the National Fellowships Program here at Hopkins as well, uh, which keeps me keeps me pretty busy. Great, thanks. And then uh, Suhas. Hey. Hi, everyone. My name is Suhasi Shwapa Pramila. I'm a final year PhD student at, John, at Material Science Department in the Whiting School. Uh, I mainly work with metals uh, for the Hopkins Extreme Mat Materials Institute, trying to figure out how these metals behave in extreme environments. For example, in a ballistic impact, let's say a bullet is coming and hitting these metals. Uh, how, how do these metals behave and how can we strengthen them? Um, so I I did my master's at IOSJ before coming to Hopkins, uh, and that was also uh, in material science and engineering. Uh, I enjoy CrossFit and hiking beyond school, uh, uh, and uh, I joined Twitter during the pandemic, and it's been a great journey so far. A lot of interesting stories to share, so I'm excited for this panel discussion. Awesome. Well, thank you for the introductions. And now, um, I guess we'll start with the actual Twitter-related questions. So when did you decide to start using Twitter? And why did you just, uh, did you start using the platform? Who would like to go first? Maybe Suhas, you had the microphone last. Great. Um, so as I mentioned, I started during the pandemic and I had registered for a couple of months, but I was usually prowling other profiles and looking at other people's tweet and not being really active. Uh, but during the pandemic, uh, I decided, hey, let's give this a try. Um, and it, 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 the, the way it started really was um, I looked up uh, academic Twitter accounts and I started following some of the tweets and I really liked what they said. And I wanted to add my own voice to that. And I started tweeting and some of the tweets really went viral. Um, I remember this one tweet that I made about naming your files, right? How we name our files like final when it really isn't final and about version control, right? Um, and that really took off. Surprisingly, I was hike, I was supposed to hike that day, uh, and I kept getting Twitter notifications, hundreds of them, hour after hour, you know, from these students, professors, and I was like, "Wow, this this is crazy." Uh, and and that's how it kind of began began. And since then, I've really found a wonderful community, academic community, should I say, using Twitter. But that's how it all started, just from making this you know, small tweet about naming research files. So yeah, that's my story. Interesting, thank you, Sohas. Um, how about Sarah? I um, had a Twitter from high school back when you just kind of used it with your friends and it definitely became a little bit dormant until like I started using it more professionally, I guess. Um, when somebody mentioned that they saw papers on Twitter, so like my advisor that I was rotating with would always send tweets to our Slack channel straight from Twitter of new papers. And I was like, oh great, if he uses Twitter for papers, I should use Twitter for papers because I don't, I can't possibly follow all the papers either. Um, and then from that, I kind of just like found faculty that were active in my department. So I'd follow them and I'd follow students. And then I kind of got like a feel for what the people that I was interested in um, tweet, like how professors and 
um, students in our department tweeted, got me started. Awesome. And then Nathan? Great. Um, I think I created an account back in like 2009 or so. Uh, it was pretty quiet, just, you know, follow your friends who also don't use it. Um, and then uh, I think when I moved to Baltimore, I started uh, following some local reporters just to get some information about local news uh, and, and started following national reporters. And so that's kind of how I got into using Twitter was by following a bunch of local reporters. And then I started following uh, some of my colleagues and then realized that there was an entire uh, entire academic community out there. Um, at the time, it was really centered uh, in my field anyway, around the digital humanities uh, for kind of obvious reasons and people who are more likely to be on um, on Twitter to begin with, uh, but then from there it expanded, uh, kind of expanded outward. Uh, medieval Twitter is a hashtag launched at some point. Uh, and so you started getting a bunch of people directly in my field. And so as others have said, you know, you start finding all of the other, uh, the professors, the other grad students, other people who are just in your uh, in your area and who are talking about really interesting things and, and having interesting discussions and just kind of went from there. Great, thank you for that. Um... Then relating to uh, the topic of publications and papers, just like Sarah and uh, I think Suhas mentioned how we, you look for the, for the scientific part of the Twitter. And uh, what, what if you don't have recent work updates or, or publications of your own? How do you promote your work effectively? So Sarah or Suhas, do you have comments about that? Yeah, I will just speak from the very early career perspective. I don't have any papers yet. Um, I started grad school in August 2019, and my program has four rotations. So I only joined a lab in June. Um, and then, of course, pandemic. But I try to share the work of others and try to, like, promote other folks. So if you looked at my Twitter, probably, like, half of it is me congratulating friends for posters or papers or whatever. Um, I'm hopefully doing a poster in May, so I'll definitely tweet and do a little thread about that. Um, and I look forward to sharing my own work, but right now I'm just kind of hyping up other folks kind of in related fields. Great. So Hans, do you have anything? Yeah, to um, as I said, I joined recently and I had a few papers by then, but I, I would echo Sarah, um, you know, you can always retweet or quote tweet, um, you know, other people's tweets. Uh, you know, for example, let's say you're working on um, some kind of a computational model and, it's not yet published, but you have a collaborator, someone you know in your field who just recently published a paper, you can say, hey, I'm, I'm working on this and it's great to see this paper. Uh, it'll definitely influence my work. So great job from you know, this particular lab. And you know that often I think is received very positively by other labs as well. And that can potentially, you know, they may turn out to be reviewers for your paper down the line. You never know. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, there are definitely, I think, ways to be active, even if you don't have papers. So don't let that hold you back. Those are great suggestions. Thank you. And a uh, question about uh, doubts or hesitations about using Twitter before you even started. What did you, what did you, what did, what, what did you think about that? Uh, seeing how many faculty members and university administrators are on it. Or, and are there any other reasons why students would hesitate? Uh, let's hear from Nathan. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I think there can be a hesitancy to, to promoting your own work um, and, and not coming across as too, uh, too promotional or, or ungenuine or something like that. Um, so that's, that's a hesitance, but I think you can, you can get around that for sure. For sure. Um, in terms of, you know, people who are, uh, who may be watching, um, whatever, you know, they're going to think what they're going to think. Um, I, I would say, I mean, you know, there's probably, there are, are also so, sorts of horror stories about people on Twitter getting into um, trouble by making national news and in not great ways. Um, so I think, I mean, there's, you know, you probably have to have an audience before that happens. Uh, but you should also be aware of what you're tweeting about. If you're tweeting about controversial issues, then uh, whether they're in your field or or more, more broadly, then that's something that you should, you know, just be aware of before you start tweeting. If you're tweeting about your own research, and it's, you know, not that exciting or benign, uh, nothing, nothing really bad is going to happen, I don't think. And if it does, you can just block somebody. <laughs> I've definitely been like hyper aware, especially lately, as I think I've had more gripes with university administration to be cautious with the battles I pick. I think I could personally give you 
a list of things I think that universities, ours and others could handle better. And I always like draft the tweet and I'm like, this is crazy. I can't believe this. Or like the craziest thing about grad school is hearing my mom react to my stories about how grad <laughs> students are tweeted, uh, treat, treated, not tweeted. Oh my God. Um, but I like kind of always try to take a deep breath because the last thing I want is for me to like apply to some university fellowship and then some administrator who happened to see it on Twitter be like, oh, Sarah Kirish, I recognize that name. Yikes. I don't think it would ever happen, but it's one of the things I'm afraid of. And you always hear like crazy stories of retribution. But just to give an example, like in in general, I've heard that you're supposed to try to make sure you pick a faculty that isn't too controversial in general so that review is easy. Like you don't want to pick somebody who's got a lot of enemies. Of course, I think there's very few faculty who would have a lot of enemies anyway. But like in that same regard, I feel like you also don't want to be somebody who's going to have a lot of enemies in general. And I know that social media can be polarizing. So I definitely bite my tongue in regard to like university treatment of grad students. But I would never bite my tongue in terms of like promoting my own work. I think self-promotion is like good. And if you're not gonna hype yourself up, who is sometimes, so. Mm -hmm. Those are great points, thank you. Uh, Suhaz, do you have, do you have comments? Uh, no, I, I mean, other thing to add that um, I've definitely seen Twitter battles between academics, and I can tell you it can quickly become very, very toxic. I recently witnessed a Twitter battle from this professor from Caltech who works on artificial intelligence by us. Uh, let me tell you, it, it, there were news report, you know, articles published about the Twitter battle. Um, I would say, I, you know, as Sarah mentioned, pick your battles. Um, I think there's definitely. Uh, more danger for young academics uh, because I, I've seen people in academia being sometimes sensitive, especially senior folks. Um, you know, if you have made a you know, kind of a crass comment or a rude comment, it might come back to hurt you uh, when they're reviewing applications or papers. Um, I would say there's always a way to kind of make your point um, without, without kind of being very rude. I would say. Uh, so I would say you can always say disappointed rather than this is bullshit. Uh, so, so things like that. So, uh, you know, you need to kind of word things carefully sometimes. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that. And related to this, so one uh, member of the audience submitted a question um, related to the toxicity of Twitter and the battle, just, you, just like you mentioned, Suhas. Uh, so the question is how do you navigate? Uh, negative uh, comments or trolls? Have any of you had experiences with them? I recently had addressed somebody down, but I was fortunate that I had this person's phone number. So I texted them, calmly explained why they were wrong. And they were like talking about something off topic. And I'm like, okay, but did you read the article linked in the tweet? And he said, no. And I was like, mm -hmm. so I was fortunate to be able to take it offline. A time I got kind of chirped in my mentions that I didn't know the person's number. I just blocked them because it was a negative take that I didn't need like associated with me. And I, of course, you know, if someone has removed or blocked a tweet, if someone's scrolling through it in their newsfeed, it still shows the tweet. And once you click it, it says this tweet has been deleted or whatever, but it was the most I could do. And I was happy that I did it. Thank you. Uh, Nathan or so has anything to add? I was just going to say that, you know, the, the worst case scenario is if you need to take your account private for a little while, if like you really get into the middle of something and things get out of control and you find too many, you know, too many people coming into your mentions, I mean, go private for a week, let things calm down and it'll probably be okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I haven't had any really confrontations, should I say, on Twitter. Uh, I post a lot of academic advice for young academics applying for grad school and other researchers about publishing papers and so on and so forth. And a lot of the times, some of the advice that I give doesn't apply to any everyone out there. And I've, I've received uh, some responses about how um, some of the advice that they mentioned doesn't fit their needs and things like that. And I see it as a very constructive conversation. Uh, but personally, you know, I tend not to follow people who are very toxic, um, who are racist. I mean, there, there is a crowd out there that, that is a bad place to be in. You don't want to have tweets showing up in your feed, kind of filling up uh, things. So I usually stay away from them. So blocking people, not following them is always a good option. Of course, you can have a little bit more sticky situations where 
you know, you have to follow someone or, you know, for example, someone in your workplace, for example, right? Uh, but the, you don't really like their tweets. So you can always, you can go to their profile and right click and say, don't show me their tweets. So you're still following them, but you don't show their tweets. So I do, I do think that Twitter gives you a lot of options to kind of curate your tweet, Twitter feed. And I really make it a point to make sure that my Twitter feed is usually very positive. Um, I'm not saying everything has to be rainbow, but you know, people who you know raise important issues in a serious manner, I, I follow them and I retweet things. So yeah. Great, thank you. I now we will shift to the more positive uh, side of Twitter and actually writing the tweets. So as all of you mentioned, uh, you tweet, some of you tweet daily. So how much do you think before you tweet? I can imagine being quite fearful sometimes of saying the wrong thing. Uh, so maybe Sarah or Nathan, would you like to comment? Yeah, I definitely think about it a little bit, but I try not to because at the end of the day, it's just social media. And like, of course you don't wanna fall into the trope of being a whiny grad student or the trope of whatever it is, bucket that you're afraid of filling. But at the same time, it's my personal profile. And if these are the things I think, I don't want to work for somebody who's going to think that that's annoying because I want to be, I guess this is a little radical, but I want to be like treated as a whole person in a workplace. So if somebody thinks that my takes are really that bad, then I don't want a job from them anyway. And I don't want to work with them anyway. And of course it's coming from a place of privilege that I say that, but like my life is too short to work with somebody who's going to look at my tweet and be like, oh, she tweeted not liking that women are still referred to as Mrs. or Miss when they go to like, oh, yeah, I don't want to work for you if you think that's weird. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Nathan, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that. I mean, I, I definitely overthink it. Uh, and it's one of the reasons <laughs> that I don't uh, post a lot of tweets in my own name or in my own words anyway. Um, I do a lot of retweeting. Um, and, and some of that is just my personality. I am fairly private. So, and that's that's a long standing thing. That's not something that's new with Twitter at all. Uh, you know, same goes for other social media profiles as well. So yeah, if I am posting something, I'm, I'm probably like very carefully considering what my wording is and, and what whatever, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> I think, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I was just gonna uh, say, you, have, you got a, a, a note in the chat. Oh. Um, that's that's a, <laughs> that's a great point. Um, I, I do uh, allow diverse opinions to come in, but I do draw a line at some point. Um, let me let me give an example. So here there was a recent controversy where Timonet Gebru, who is the AI researcher, was fired from Google from expressing some of our opinions and. Um, the, the Twitter battle that I mentioned was actually between her uh, and Anima Anand Kumar, who was a professor at Caltech, and there was another professor from the University of Washington, which, whom I'm not going to name, uh, who kind of really started the, the whole Twitter battle, and which kind of turned very ugly. And I can tell you that some of the comments that that that, that person really made um, were just out of the line, right? Downright insulting, downright racist, and um, there was a time where I had blocked that person because I just didn't want to see that, that person's tweets anymore. But um, after a while, I actually saw a lot of responses from other academics to that person's you know, tweets, even though I could not see the, see the actual tweets themselves. And I said, okay, you know, definitely I think this, this is a conversation that needs to be followed. So I think it sometimes changes over time, whether you want to allow people back in, you know, you can definitely, I think, um, change your opinion along the time. Because ultimately what you need to really, uh, you need to realize is uh, there's a lot of data flow that comes in through Twitter, right into your mind space. And you don't wanna be harming your mental health in the process. So, you know, there are weeks where you're struggling with a lot of things. You really don't wanna be following and looking at tweets from all of these people. Um, you know, there was uh, another tweet by a uh, right wing person about why is it that you know, men don't wear manly clothes. Uh, <laughs> I, that, I was like, you know, this is so ridiculous uh, conversation, frankly. So yeah, you can definitely change, change who you follow and you can unblock people. But I, I do see a lot of diverse opinions and I encourage that, but 
I, I draw a line at overly racist comments of people. Thanks, Sahas. Um, related to this, we have a question from the audience. Uh, since so many uh, smart people are on it, how do you get over the intimidation of posting your own ideas? Any thoughts on that, um, Sarah, maybe? I am definitely just starting to kind of move from like takes that are pretty non-controversial and like would be pretty agreed on to kind of a little bit more I don't even think controversial is the word, but just like closer to things that are important to me where like, it's not just stuff that everyone else has already thought of because I think it's taken me time to kind of like calibrate my expectations and what I'm comfortable with. But I think other than time, like I find it helpful if I'm gonna send what I think is a risky tweet to just send a screenshot to somebody else that I'm friends with that is also active in academic Twitter and they be like, yeah, I would totally say that. Or, oh, maybe do not wanna include like whatever word it is that was kind of the tricky point there so sometimes start like taking the initial sentiment which i try not to lose and just like i think sue asked earlier said like you can say disappointed instead of disgusted by or whatever and like making little edits like that um helps me not lose my voice while also like getting used to saying something that is close to my heart exactly and so other nathan do you have uh, have you had experience with struggling with whether to post your ideas or not? I mean, sure. And uh, eventually you just, you just need to say something and that's uh, just, you know, go ahead and, and say something. I mean, start, start small. You don't have to, to show up on Twitter and, um, and uh, have all of the, the right things to say. Start by sharing, you know, little cool things about your work that you, that you discovered. Or uh, I think Suha said earlier, you know, just by, you know, uh, quote tweeting other people's stuff or replying to them and saying how much you like it and how great it is. And that's a great way to start building community as well. Um, you know, following people, getting follow backs and, you know, mutual likes and stuff like that. And, you know, find people who are interested in, in the stuff that you're interested in. And I mean, just, just start small. You don't have to, to change the world in your first tweet. Exactly. Well, thank you, Nathan. So has anything or? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, the, the, yes, there are a lot of famous people, there are a lot of important people in your field, but I, I would say that try to build a sort of a positive kind of env environment through your channel, you know. I think Twitter is a great platform where you can really uplift people. Um, you know, you can celebrate their successes uh, a lot of the times I see, um, I got into med school program after trying for three years and that tweet has like 5,000 retweets and I'm so happy I, I retweeted to or I like it. And there's there's a really an opportunity for, for us to really celebrate and uplift so many people just by small actions. And it gives me really great joy. Um, there are also times where you can actually be very supportive. Um, you know, for example, this this um, admission cycles, some of them applied to seven schools and got seven rejections. Um, and, and the entire Twitter community, you know, kind of rallied around uh, and several of them posted, look, you know, I fail in this and this, because a lot of the times in our professional kind of uh, platforms, like a website or anything, we always tend to post positive things, right? A list of accomplishments in our CV, I got this grant, but nobody really, posts uh, failures. I've seen one or two professors post it, and that's been a kind of an interesting uh, side note, but Twitter is one where we can actually exchange meaningful experiences and not just positive ones. Um, so, you know, if you're a young ac academic and you're struggling with something and you post something, th there's definitely a chance for you to hear from other people's experience and learn from it. So it's not just some advertising platform. It's, it's really a way, I think, to kind of connect to people. Thank you for that, uh, Suhas. So moving on, um, if you sit uh, in front of a computer and you open Twitter and you feel like tweeting, but how do you know if a tweet is worth sending? So who, who has uh, ideas about that? Maybe Sarah or Suhas, Nathan? Usually I get really fired up about the stuff I tweet. So like the three main genres of my Twitter and I'm gonna loop in um, the answer, my personal answer to Steven's question. Steven asked, I use Twitter to follow academic stuff but also other interests. Do you think I should have two separate accounts? My 
four major tenets of tweets are hyping up friends in my network that includes both academia and folks I know from outside. Um, and by hyping up, I usually just mean I quote tweet with congratulations, um, just because it seems like a nice thing to do and hopefully it like increases awareness of their work. Second main thing is um, Georgetown basketball, which as I started with is one of my personal interests. And it sounds really stupid, but like engaging with other fans from like across the country has made the experience so, and around the world, I'm learning a lot of people, um, has made it such a richer experience and you kind of never know who you're gonna know. Um, so like I had followed this guy who started a Georgetown basketball blog and then he got laid off a few months ago and he posted that the alumni like website wasn't working and I happened to have a meeting that day with someone in the Georgetown alumni office. So I said, send me your screenshots, let me know like what you're doing. And like what the mistake was, the person I had the meeting with fixed it based on his screenshots and then he got a job from it. And now we're friends. And like, I was just so happy to be part of that. And now he always has the inside scoop with basketball. So he's always telling me like, who's gonna be recruited and all this kind of stuff. And it's just like a richer life experience. And if I'd had a separate account, maybe I wouldn't have been looking on that account that day or whatever. Um, other genre of tweets are basketball and like general grad school stuff. Um, but I will say that I think that the accounts I most enjoy following are where I can tell that the person actually cares. So my barometer for whether a tweet is worth tweeting is like, is it something I feel even a little bit about? Because tweets are free, characters are almost free, you might as well just write it. Because um, if I find like a grad student or someone who somebody else retweeted and I go to see if I want to follow their profile, if they don't have a lot of tweets or if it's a very sanitized thing, I'm much less interested in it because I could just go on bio archive if I just wanted a scream of papers. I could just go to nature genetics if I just wanted papers. Like I want to know the person because otherwise they're not adding to, of course you can get adding, anything can add to your life. But for me, a sanitized thing does not add to my life. So I would recommend having it all in one. I think it can Thanks. depend too on, uh, sorry, on just how much, um, like what the other interests are, how much you intend on um, posting about those things too. Uh, if you're, you know, if your feed ends up only being, you know, 25% professional stuff, but that's what you're interested in. I mean, you, you might find it hard to, to gain or keep followers if you're mostly po posting about some other obscure hobby. Uh, but sometimes those obscure hobbies can, can be really interesting to follow and learn about. Uh, I've learned so many things about stuff that I didn't know anything about at all before. Um, just based on, you know, the stuff that other, that people whose primary, you know, academic interests I'm interested in also have, you know, these other hobbies. So, I mean, I think finding a balance is great, but I mean, if you run like a heavy, like side business or something like that, you know, for a, um, for a hobby or something like maybe you want to keep those things separate or if, you know, you can't, uh, if you can't find a balance necessarily. Great. Thank you for that. Then I think uh, the next question is also uh, targeted towards Nathan, uh, since you mentioned you like sometimes retweet uh, more than you tweet. So question is, do I always have to tweet or can I simply observe or retweet other people's thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I don't tweet that much. I, you know, try to retweet stuff occasionally and usually I forget that that's actually an option in the first place, but I have found a lot of value just being on Twitter and observing most of the time and tossing out occasional likes. Uh, I've been able to find those communities of, of scholars, um, of, uh, of other grad students, of, um, of you know, major scholars in the field and, and get value from just listening to what they have to say, uh, finding uh, potential opportunities, uh, just getting to know people a little bit, getting to know people who are in my very obscure tiny field who I wouldn't um, have known about otherwise from other universities. Uh, and that's, that's added a, a lot of value to, um, to what I do. So absolutely. Great, so let's, oh yeah. So it's uh, not a shame to retweet all the time, uh, a lot of the time. Uh, great. So now talk about um, hobbies in the outside world uh, other than academia. Any tips on how to incorporate interesting hobbies and show that you are a well-rounded person? So I'd like to comment for hobbies out in me, Sarah, you mentioned you, you were on the biking team, right? Yeah. Um... I'm still working on my like foray into what's called bike Twitter. There's a hashtag, um, especially in the DC area, which is where I live now. Um, it's really nice because I've started seeing stuff like petitions. Um, I signed some petition about changing a law about bicyclists having to stop at stop signs and then it got passed by the Virginia Senate and I was really pleased to have been a part of that. I've, I'm like just getting into civic engagement also. So I was very happy um, and I never would have known about it 
without Twitter. Um, I think it's in terms of hobbies for me, it's not so much about showing that I'm round, well rounded so much as curating information that for me, Twitter is like almost my Pomodoro method. Like if I have to go downstairs to get water, I look at Twitter on my walk down there. Or if I'm waiting for like a two minute code to run, that's like too short to do other work. I'm for sure on Twitter. Um, and so I want stuff that's going to be showing me like just facets of like interesting things. And I guess I'll just give one fast example. Like I tweeted once about biking and then a few bike people followed me. So I followed them back. And then from having followed them, cause I use a hashtag, so they found it. And then from having followed them, I found out about this volunteer thing that happens literally every weekend, a mile from my apartment. And I never had heard of it. And now I go every Saturday well, I've been, I'm in New York right now, but I used to go every Saturday and I'm going to be hosting a couple of their events in April. And I'm so happy about it. And I literally wouldn't have known about it except for Twitter. And like it, it yeah, it's much less about demonstrating that I'm well-rounded because to whom and who really cares. My feed is definitely for me. Yeah, I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you. All right. So uh, we touched the topic of the kind of the balance between the personal and academic accounts. So would you recommend having a separate uh, personal and academic account or just having one? And what boundaries do you keep uh, either way? So, so has, I think. Uh, sure. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's certainly an important and valid question. And I've seen that come up in the Twitter space also several times. Um, I think that when it comes to um, is, you know, in certain cases, having two accounts helps. Um, uh, it really depends on your circumstance. Uh, but you know, one of the things I want to kind of make, make clear is that it, having two accounts is not about trying to hide what you're doing. Um, for example, I really like to uh, post about diversity issues, LGBTQ rights and things like that. And you know, as I was mentioning, I even if my employer is looking through my Twitter, I want them to see that so that I support it. Uh, I, I, wrote, I came across this tweet which, which kind of summed up my thoughts on that, which is go where you're celebrated, not tolerated. Right? That kind of really sums up my philosophy right there. But I do think that in academia, you need to be a bit careful. Um, I had a lot of thoughts about the previous administration, but you know, I, I didn't tweet about them. Um, to me, I think that rather than trying to kind of come across as controversy or anything, I, I really think that I really value creating a positive space through my channel, uh, where I, I really, you know, do speak about important topics, but in a, in a kind of a very safe environment sort of a way. That's what I wanted. But I do know several people out there who are really passionate about things. I follow people who are, um, you know, organizing, you know, and they're into policy, they are trying to pass something, they're very active. Um, and I certainly respect that, but you really, I think, have to kind of figure out what, what kind of a online presence you want to have. Um, for example, if you're going into a faculty market, uh, academic market, and uh, you're posting all kinds of crazy political things, um, that'll certainly give your faculty search committee a pass. It's such a risk averse process and such a competitive market that it'll certainly give a pass and that might actually impact you, right? Uh, it's another thing whether it's right or wrong but it'll have an impact on that. So what I would say is think about that impact and figure out whether that's something that you'd be okay with, right? Or taking the risk and then modulate your Twitter presence accordingly, I would say. So, you know, sometimes it helps. I, I've seen people handle two accounts. I've seen some people say, this is me. This is all of me. Take it, I'll leave it. And <laughs> that's fine too. So uh, it depends on you decide what you want to do, but think about, be aware of the consequences of that. And I, I just add um, to that, I, I agree with both of you and I, I, there are definitely 
different approaches to this. And I mean, all I would add on one of those sides is that, you know, to remember that that both social media and academia are both extraordinarily performative spaces. And, you know, maybe that means that you end up with a more sanitized Twitter feed because, you know, you're trying to, you know, play a certain kind of role on uh, on your social media or for your academic future academic career. Um, but just, you know, keep keep that in mind uh, as well and, and the way that you choose to, yeah, for better or worse. Um, and I, I don't necessarily think that's a good thing, but uh, but it is it is certainly the case. Um, I have a friend who uh, who basically missed out on an academic job because uh, in the end they told her, uh, quote, she had too much personality on Twitter, um, which is, just wow. extraordinary. It's a summer um, that wouldn't have been happy working. Yeah, I mean, it's in the end, it's probably for the best. Uh, but it's, I mean, but yeah, it, it certainly happens. Uh, and it's, it's not always pretty. Awesome. And I guess relating to this, striking the perfect balance and um, being careful about some areas, like Suhas mentioned, some markets that, you know, you might want to think about more before you tweet. Um, how do you make sure that your tweets have the correct tone and don't come off as being glorious? So does anyone have thoughts about that? Suhaz or Sarah? You don't want to come off as what, Ona? As being glorious. I have to Google this was This is a question um, from the audience. So kind of uh, overly proud, you know. Oh, oh uh, if I don't know the word, I guess it's hard to be like that. <laughs> Uh, I saw this question earlier on Twitter too, and I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, I I don't think that we should kind of criticize people celebrating things. I mean, if you're not going to be excited about the small things in your life, who will be? Uh, I would say. Um, I think one of the things you need to recognize is that Twitter has really a diverse spectrum of people people who have had a lot of difficulties in applying to colleges and you know, gaining admissions and being able to afford things. And it, it, there are people who have had um, a lot of help in getting to where they are, right? There's, there's a really a spectrum of people. And I've seen people get excited from getting their paper done or having accomplished some experiments um, you know, that they are just simply getting up that day and being able to work. And in each of the situations, that particular achievement was important to that person. And that person is putting it out there because they feel that that's something that is worth celebrating. And, you know, it may seem very small or trivial to people, right? Uh, but I think we need to kind of let them celebrate. If you don't, if you think that somebody is being pompous or very, very glorious about their achievements and you don't like that, don't follow, don't follow them or block them. Or don't, don't see their tweets. Um, I think sometimes in, in academia, we um, kind of frown upon people who kind of boast about their work. To me, it's, it's marketing, right? You are, you are trying to kind of sell your work, sell yourself, I don't think anything wrong is wrong with it. Um, I think you know what, one of these comments actually reminded me about a lot of the kind of the deeper issues and serious issues that these comments bring up. Uh, let me give you an example. I know a faculty, uh, a female faculty, and uh, who does amazing job, by the way. But interestingly, without me leading the conversation, I've had several male faculty in different institutions comment that this particular female faculty was very boastful of her work. And uh, she was, oh, she's someone, she will let you know that she's doing a good job or something like that. If, if another male person had done this, I would not have heard these comments, right? Uh, so what it really showed me was that they were jealous of the success. You know, that particular female professor had given a TED talk and that had blown up on YouTube, you know, garnering millions of views and um, several other faculty, male faculty, um, felt intimidated by that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, 
there are you know, a lot of hesitation sometimes among academics to post good things happening in their life. What I would say is don't hold back. Uh, celebrate all the small things, all the big things. There's a wonderful community out there who will support you. Can I just piggyback in a slightly negative way on that, Suhas? <laughs> I think there are always going to be people who are going to have a problem with you being happy or successful in any way. I could have an entire Mean Girls Burn book of folks who are just being arbitrarily negative and taking people down and saying, well, she only got that job because she's a girl or worse. She only got the job because she's a pretty young female. Check that. So no matter what you write online, people are always going to be saying that there's always going to be someone who doesn't want you to have whatever it is. Like there's nothing you can do about it. So trying to curtail your celebration of yourself and your celebration of others for these quite honestly, haters who have no lives who are so confident behind the screen, like get out of town. It, it, you should like be you. And anytime I see, I, I don't exactly do what Sue has said, where like if somebody gets into med school on the first time and they have like 5,000 likes on those, I kind of feel like, okay, like I don't need, cause you know, if you like something, it shows up on your, your followers timelines. Maybe that person had enough exposure for the day. The first 5,000 people got it taken care of. If I see someone celebrating a little thing that has like 10 likes or four likes, I'm like, retweet that, quote, tweet that. Like, yeah, because you want to amplify that person because if you don't like them, simply mute them. Anyone that you don't want to celebrate that's in your thing, I don't blame you. I have people who wouldn't, I wouldn't want to celebrate either, but I don't look at them on Twitter, you know? Great. Um, thank you. Now, uh, continuing this thread of academia. So as academics, uh, what does Twitter offer to you? And this relates to also the question that one of our audience members had, do you find it to take up too much time? If so, uh, how do you balance the amount of time you spend on social media? So maybe we'll go with Nathan, then Sarah, then Suhas. Um, I, th I spoke a little bit about some of the stuff that I think it's offered and I think we all have in terms of, of finding communities and finding other people who are uh, doing stuff that's that's related to our work and and so I do find it really valuable for that um, it has uh, resulted in me finding opportunities academic opportunities that I wouldn't have uh, come across any other way and that have been uh, really positive and in those relationships that have have come from there um, in terms of time balance, I can easily get sucked into the Twitter feed. It's really bad. And there have been points where it's just endless and endless scrolling. And as I mentioned too, uh, you know, I use it to follow a lot of news as well. So when when the news is heavy, then, then the doom scrolling just goes and goes and goes. Um, one of the ways that I've learned to mitigate that is um, I actually use TweetDeck most of the time for Twitter, um, which, which brings up multiple columns of different stuff. But I have a lot of, um, a lot of private lists um, of people. So if, you know, if the balance is starting to get really off and I just am, am scrolling, it makes a lot of sense to, you know, to kind of bucket your accounts into like, okay, here are the people that like, no matter what, I really want to see what they have to say. Or, you know, like, I want to see what my personal friends are saying, or I want to see what the people in my department are saying or whatever. And you can, you know, then choose to like only look at certain groups of people. There are a lot of people you know, I follow who I, I enjoy the stuff, but if I don't see it, it's not the end of the world at all. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but it allows me to say like, okay, well, as long as I stay on top of like this small group of people and takes, you know, not a lot of time because there aren't that many of them, then um, then the balance can be a lot easier. Great, thanks. Yeah, uh, personally, what I found is that I usually at some given point of time, I'm addicted to only one social media more than the rest of them. I hardly use Facebook anymore. Um, uh, you know, I go in and wish happy birthday to my friends at some points, but I, I hardly go there anymore. Um, Twitter, sometimes I, I spend a little bit more time during the weekend when I have time. Um, so what I do is I, go, I open up a Word document and I write down a bunch of things that I want to say and I just go onto Twitter for five minutes and post all of them. Uh, and this is really helpful when you're trying to do Twitter threads about a single topic where you have a lot of kind of connected threads one after the other. So it helps to kind of just write down everything you want to say in a document and just transfer it one by one. Um, it looks like I tweeted everything in like a few seconds interval, but I, I might have spent like 20 or 30 minutes before that trying to kind of, uh, I did that for example, when I was typing out uh, a lot of uh, useful tips for writing statement of purpose for graduate school. Um, yeah. 
Great, thank you. Um, all right, a question I think uh, for Sarah. Uh, do you tend to use uh, Twitter more so than other social media? What kinds of platforms do you use and why? So Sarah, uh, I know you're also pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, what difference have you found between these platforms? Twitter is so much easier for me. I think because of like all the practice I've had curating my voice and honestly the bar for posting, I think this is stupid and I think this is in my head and I kind of want to work on it. The bar for posting on LinkedIn feels so much higher to me. I used to post on LinkedIn a lot more um, in my job because I always had a report coming up or like a briefing that I did and there was a lot more to share. And I was also much more like my LinkedIn more wholly reflected my professional network at the time than my Twitter does now. And of course, I haven't really done anything as a grad student yet. I know, but like that you would actually post on LinkedIn. Uh, so the bar, yeah, feels a lot higher and it's a lot more sanitized, which I'm not, as you may tell, is not me. Um, but LinkedIn has been really helpful for following along with people's careers and like having an excuse to message people and keep the network fresh because there's a whole separate conversation about networking that we could have, but like, I don't really believe in networking with someone who you wouldn't want to have a coffee with or a water with, because if they're not like a pleasant, engaging person who you actually want to hear about, you're not going to enjoy it and you're not going to be receptive to it. And it's not going to enrich your experience. So in that regard, LinkedIn is awesome because folks are sharing about themselves. It gives me a jumping off point to say, Hey, I saw that you posted that article that looked awesome. Like hope you're doing well, or Hey, congrats on your update, your job update or whatever. And I think LinkedIn is really powerful for those things, but I'm definitely more of a responder than a poster. So Twitter's a lot easier for me for sure. And I spend much more time on it. I maybe go on LinkedIn like once every other day, just cause you get the notification about folks, new jobs and stuff. But, um, yeah, it, then Twitter just fits, in my experience, Twitter also is much like where the academics are. I don't know if that's different for other fields, but for biology, I even see biology faculty posting about Twitter on, posting about LinkedIn on Twitter, like, are, am I supposed to have one? And I'm like, eh, you're all here, so I don't know. Certainly in my field, I mean, there's nobody uses LinkedIn. Um, in, in terms of academic Twitter, I mean, maybe they have a profile, but nobody posts anything or, or does anything with it. Um, all of the academics and at least in the humanities are all on Twitter. And that's that's the only place where you would be if you want to be engaged in those conversations. Uh, there, there are some Facebook groups and I think using Facebook for professional purposes is just a terrible idea. And I will not join any of those groups even if they were beneficial to me. It's just, it seems awful and I don't want to have anything to do with it. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan. Um, all right, we will move on to the next question then. Um, question from one of the registrants, um, which says, I'm brand new to Twitter. How can I create a constructive routine of checking science Twitter without going down a wormhole? I think we talked about this a little bit already, right? For me, just real quick, I followed a few journals that I really like, including the preprint journal in my field, BioArchive, because that has like the hottest stuff. Um, and that's really helpful for engaging the field and then seeing the name. So if a paper gets me to click on it, I then try to follow the people who were the corresponding and first authors. Um, but also a lot of times people will just tweet their own paper. So like if I were starting from scratch as a grad student right now, I would try to go find anyone in my department who's on it, faculty and grad students, follow them because they'll post papers and that'll show you kind of who's in your field. I think I actually like randomly mentioned a paper to a faculty, to my advisor this week because it was somebody who I only knew from Twitter and he was like, oh yeah, that guy's cool. Like, that'd be awesome to like work with him on whatever. Um, so those things do happen pretty organically. It's just a matter of like starting and making sure you're sort of in the room, so to speak, to see these people and find out that they exist. Um, anytime we have a seminar speaker in my department, I try to follow them if they like, seemed interesting, which of course most of them are. Um, yeah, I would just start with like folks that you kind of know and then you can curate. And of course you can always unfollow somebody or you can mute them if they're not driving or as your interests shift. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, all right, then the next uh, question we have is, during your time on Twitter, what are some of the most prominent pros and cons you have noticed that students should be aware of? For example, what you sh what should you say, what not? So maybe let's hear from Nathan. Pros and cons. I mean, I, I feel like we've covered a lot of this in some ways already. And the pros are, are you know, making making friends and, and meeting people and uh, and sharing your work and uh, finding connections uh, for for me anyway. Um, 
the cons. I mean, it certainly does take a lot, take up a lot of time in my life. Uh, and as we've also talked about, you know, you can get involved in some pretty nasty spats uh, or, you know, big disagreements on Twitter. And I mean, I would recommend staying away from that as best you can. Um, but I, overall, it's it's been a very positive experience for me anyway. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you for the thoughts. Uh, so as we have seen in the last few years, Twitter has been put in this position of an arbiter with the goal to eliminate false and unethical tweets. So from your experience, what are some ethical and safety considerations involved in using the platform? So Suhaz, perhaps, if you have a comment. Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, you can, <laughs> it's, 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 I think sometimes it's up to you to kind of double check what's happening. Um, a lot of things trend, but not <laughs> all the trend, trending news is, is sort of newsworthy, I would say, that you, know, you kind of need to be aware of it because these Twitter algorithms do work in a certain way. And Twitter does, I think, sometimes step in and stem a lot of fake news, especially now, given that we know what kind of a destructive force it can have on our society. Uh, what I would say is just, just be cognizant of some of the accounts. Don't believe everything you see. Um, just just double check double double check what you see that's what i would say and also just be aware of who some of the people are that are going to be interested in certain topics um medieval twitter has a huge problem with uh with white nationalism um because white nationalists love um love the crusades they love um the vikings they love a lot of stuff that's associated with um with the middle ages and uh, and so they get involved, they'll jump in uh, to conversations about these sorts of things. And so, you know, if, if somebody uh, follows me who's got um, a profile picture or a header image of uh, crusade imagery, uh, you know, that's an immediate block. Um, and some, I mean, these are horribly toxic spaces, but uh, they can also, you know, will take your, your tweets and amplify them in a very negative way. And then you start getting, uh, you know, even more of it. So, I mean, be aware of what those flashpoints of negative conversation are in your field. Um, you know, some of the, the stuff that about around AI that Suhas was talking about, you know, where the conversations can get bad, where the, uh, the groups that are involved can get really bad and, and be aware of those and, you know, either avoid them or be prepared to, to deal with them if you do want to jump in. Yeah, great points, Nathan. Thank you. And then we'll go back to the, again, how, how to start using Twitter. For someone who has never logged into Twitter but is interested in it, do you have any tips or strategies about finding that Twitter voice? What what do you recommend we start with first? I think for me, it would be just being genuine. Like some of the best rapport I had with faculty in my department is because they liked one of my random tweets. Like one of them was when the pandemic first started, my brother put a big mirror. I don't. I don't even know where in my house this thing was, but like a huge full length mirror in his room because he couldn't go to the gym and he is a lifter or whatever. So he likes to look at himself. And I was like, ha ha, so important, huge, big mirror. And like three faculty in my department liked it. And then I was on an email thread with them and they were like, haha, Sarah, how's your brother faring with his gym? And I was like, see, like now we have a personal connection. I'm not just a first year grad student in their program that I'm not in their lab of, like that they've never met. There's some kind of sort of like, I guess I'll repeat myself, written, richness of the experience where they had something to like remember you by, I think that kind of stuff really helps. So just to say what I've said a thousand times, being yourself, posting things that are important to you, posting things that are something you yourself would find funny, engaging with people who are like uplifting and relevant. I think it, it's easier to curate the voice, at least for me, if I kind of like take a deep breath and just remember that it's the internet and like people, yeah, are gonna be nice or not nice regardless of what you post. That's a the, that's great, Sarah. What a what an interesting example. Huh? <laughs> um, okay, um, so we're coming towards uh, the end um, of today's panel, and uh, I would like to ask if you have any final words of encouragement or advice, and of course, how can students follow you on Twitter? I, I guess I can go. Um... 
What I would say is there's a tremendous benefit to joining Twitter and finding your space and, and following great people. Um, I remember following this professor who posted about uh, some opportunity in there, you know, and I ended up applying to that fellowship and now I'm being considered for this $100,000 fellowship, right? Um, and I've found multi, and I'm also, um, I've just recently started a startup and I've been following a lot of people, uh, giving a lot of business ideas and so on and so forth. And to me, I've started kind of exploring more people in that space and it's been great learning from them. I can tell you that Twitter is definitely a powerful networking tool. Uh, if you use it deftly, you can make connections, you can build research collaborations, uh, you can join labs. I've seen professors post uh, advertisement about postdoctoral positions are in a PhD positions or something else. Um, so I can tell you that you can definitely kind of follow the right people and bookmark the tweets. Bookmarking tweets is one way you can curate a lot of wonderful tools. You come across so many ni nice things. Uh, I think Nathan mentioned about lists. I maintain lists as well. Whenever I come across, for example, uh, you know, for my startup for, as an example, when I whenever I come across people who might be potential collaborators for my startup down the line. I just add them to the group so that I can one day reach out to them and so on and so forth. So you can definitely use it um, to, to kind of really help you in academia. Um, and another thing I would say is it Twitter really can serve multiple purposes. You know, I don't just follow academic accounts or um, let's say startup accounts. I also follow accounts that bring a lot of joy and humor to it. And I see a lot of people uh, post very funny things about things in academia. Uh, I remember when I started Twitter, one of the first tweet I really kind of liked was a tweet that said, uh, academia is all about downloading PDFs that you'll never read. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah. You know, you can really curate the feed that you can get, and if you do that, um, I think you you have a wonderful space where you can grow. Yeah, so I would say I would highly encourage everyone to uh, explore that and think about it, uh, and stay away from bad people. <laughs> Um, I'll just quickly say, yeah, be yourself, have a good time. I followed the folks who dropped their um, handles in the chat, but if anybody else wants to follow, of course, I'll hype you up. Um, and also sometimes I follow people and look at who they follow and who follow them and I follow from there. That's a really helpful way. A lot of people have very informative bios, very important to me. I rarely follow someone with a blank um, little bio on Twitter unless I know them personally. Um, shoot, I had something that I thought was really worth sharing and I completely forgot. Lean in. It's a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to meeting you guys on Twitter. And I'll just add, uh, uh, like Suhas, I mean, lots of opportunities for for really great stuff. I got a, a full ride to our to my biggest conference in my field from an opportunity that I just happened to see on Twitter that uh, expanded into a bunch of networking and now a project I work on as part of a, a, a huge Mellon grant, a very small part of a huge Mellon grant. Um, so, I mean, lots of opportunities that come from that, but just start small, just follow people you find interesting, see what they're talking about, who they're following, um, expand your network from there. Uh, conferences are great, live tweet conferences if you don't have anything else to tweet. Uh, if you don't, you know, start by talking about other people's work and, and then you can expand it into your own. But it's a, I think it's a really great tool and a really useful one. Great, so thank you all so, so much, uh, Sarah, Suhas, Nathan. Um, it's, been, it's been a great time. And I think now we will try to find our Twitter voice and I think everyone who was here will be much better at it. So thank you for all the advice and for all the thoughts and for that enthusiasm. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, thank Anna you. and Rashi. And thank you. This was a really wonderful panel and please feel free to contact us uh, on Twitter, anyone on the chat. So free, welcome to message us if you need anything. Right. Yeah. And thanks to the participants, of course, for being here. <laughs>